This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay, so today I uh, will talk about the information problem, the black hole information problem, and different aspects. So first, uh, let's recall the whole formulation of the problem, uh, the original formulation by Hawking. So what he said was the following. So imagine we uh, have some matter in some known state, and we collapse it to form a black hole. Then this black hole will uh, slowly evaporate and emit uh, Hawking radiation. Um, this Hawking radiation comes from uh, essentially the entanglement you had in the vacuum state. So there is one particle coming out and one going in, uh, roughly speaking. So it's the modes of the vacuum. They don't know much about the initial state. In fact, all information about the initial state quickly dies down. So as you form the black hole, uh, so initially uh, you have some memory of uh, what fell in, but eventually that memory uh, starts decaying exponentially. So for any perturbation near the horizon, we have some exponential, exponentially quick decay, um, and it settles pretty quickly to a black hole. In fact, you can look in the web for the simulations people do of, uh, let's say, collision of two black holes, and you can see that uh, very quickly you get uh, the final black hole solution, for example. You can see these videos. But, but anyway, now in the flat space case, sometimes there are very long distance perturbations that decay more like uh, power loss in time, but uh, this have to do with very long wavelength uh, modes which are outside the horizon. Um, so if we were to put a black hole in a box, uh, it would decay pretty quickly, or for black holes in ADS also they decay quickly in this way. Um, so, um, and then, so quickly it becomes uh, essentially a black hole with no information about what fell in, and the Hawking radiation sort of comes out. Um, so perhaps I should draw a little diagram. Uh, so we have this collapse. Um, so this is the matter that collapsed. And the Hawking radiation is generated later, much later, from the entanglement present in the vacuum, okay, with no information of uh, what fell in. And this radiation carries away the initial mass of the black hole, and we can, fall, we can track it uh, up to uh, very late times when the black hole becomes of order the Planck scale, and there the calculation is not valid anymore. But we assume that, uh, if we assume that this evaporates, uh, relatively quickly, so in a time uh, of the order of, uh, let's say we cut off this, the 10 Planck scales and we uh, say that within uh, time comparable to the time we expect that black hole to evaporate, uh, all the energy comes out, then uh, you cannot uh, send in an arbitrary information, a large amount of information during that time. So this radiation contains uh, at least at the level we are calculating it and according to this type of ideas, contains no information and the information of the initial black hole, which could have been arbitrarily big, cannot be uh, contained in the evaporation of the last uh, piece, which is uh, always the same, always uh, universal, uh, if that evaporation takes uh, a finite amount of time, independent of the initial black hole mass. Um, so in this case, uh, then, uh, we had this thermal radiation, and we have no information about the, the matter that fell in, and uh, we have this information problem. So that's the black hole information problem. Now, sometimes uh, people say, well, look, if I'm sitting here far away, I always uh, can see this uh, matter that is falling in. Uh, therefore, uh, from the point of view of the outside, it will look like uh, you know, matter falls in, and it never really quite crosses the horizon. Uh, in fact, uh, Sometimes, in the, especially in the Russian literature, they were calling black holes frozen stars in the sense that um, they would look uh, from the outside as if uh, the matter is falling into the black, the black hole horizon and never actually crossing. But of course, um, what happens is that everything that is falling in here is being redshifted, and at some point it gets redshifted below the uh, Hawking temperature. So we should remember that here we, this, we have a thermal looking state from the outside, and at some point any perturbation will uh, redshift uh, to energies or uh, below the Hawking temperature, and at that point you really can't distinguish it anymore. Right? 
So even though in this diagram you, it looks uh, like you could look backwards, really, due to the quantum effects, you can't really look backwards so much. Um, okay, so that's one point. Um, now, so this is the uh, information problem for the outside observer. So if we are sitting outside, we are very far away. We can define, we expect it to be able to define this S matrix precisely. So far away, I know what I'm doing when I'm throwing things in. We know what we are doing when we collect the radiation. Uh, we're sitting very far away from the black hole. Um, the fluctuations of space-time and long distances can be neglected, and, uh, and we can define this S matrix. Um, alternatively, we can do this, the whole uh, thing in ADS, so we can uh, form a black, we can send in some matter from the boundary, forming the black hole, and then this uh, black hole might evaporate again, um, and so we can do this whole process also in ADS. Uh, in ADS, we could do it for a small black hole or a big black hole. Um, and uh, this sending in matter from the boundary um, involves coupling the, well, modifying the boundary conditions here at infinity to send in matter. And here, absorbing the, the evaporation products or at uh, the boundary also implies uh, modifying the boundary conditions so that you can take energy away from ADS. Um, so, if uh, ADS-CFT is correct, so if indeed the physics uh, in ADS is given by the conformal field theory, um, then uh, in the conformal field theory, we just have unitary evolution, and we cannot have any information loss. Um, we further have a dictionary for translating asymptotic observables for asymptotic observables. By asymptotic observables, I mean measurements of the fields uh, close to the boundary. Okay? So any measurement of the field close to the boundary can be translated into a corresponding measurement in the CFT of some particular operator. Okay. So the insertion of some operator, the expectation value of some operator, or coupling the operator to some external system. Um, so all these things, if we do them here close to the boundary, uh, we know how to translate them to the conformal field theory. So we know how to set this up uh, both in the boundary and the bulk in a way that we know what we are doing on both sides. Then we let this happen in the bulk and in the boundary something completely unitary is happening. And here we know how to read off uh, these observables on the boundary. And those observables are given by unitary evolution. Um, and so we expect if ads -CFT is correct, then the black hole as seen from the outside should evolve unitarily. Okay, so um, so most people are willing to believe that ads -CFT is correct, so they view this as an argument that uh, there is some way of defining quantum gravity. So quantum gravity as defined via the, let's say, ads -CFT correspondence, uh, you uh, will have some way of defining quantum gravity so that black holes are unitary. Of course, you could also say, well, uh, maybe black holes are not unitary, and this is proof that ads -CFT is wrong. Okay. Uh, uh, but we'll, we'll, uh, let's, uh, most people are willing to assume that ads -CFT is correct and that uh, understanding uh, better what was wrong in the previous arguments uh, will teach us uh, something about space-time. So let's, uh, let's look in more detail at uh, a particular version of the information paradox in ads uh, where we can try to understand a little more uh, what, what, what is the problem with the previous argument. So we'll consider, uh, let's say ADS, this is the spatial boundary of ADS, and we'll consider a large black hole in ADS. And by large black hole, I mean a black hole which is uh, thermodynamically stable, 
which is in equilibrium with uh, the thermal radiation outside. So in, in flat space, if you have a black hole, it will not be, it uh, will radiate and lose, it, lose its energy. Um, and however, in ADS, you can have a black hole in thermal equilibrium with the radiation because the radiation just bounces off from the boundary. And um, if the black hole is large enough, there will be um, there will the, this, the amount of energy in the radiation will be small compared to the to the black hole mass, and we can have a stable configuration. Okay, so that's what we consider. So a large uh, black hole in ADS. Um, and on the boundary, we consider uh, a thermal system. So we uh, consider a thermal, thermal system with the usual uh, thermal density matrix. Okay. Um, and now we are going to look at a particular observable, which uh, will have different behaviors depending on whether the uh, evolution is unitary or not. So we'll, uh, we'll look, do the following. So if this is, let's say this is time. So we have the black hole here. And so we'll uh, do a perturbation here on the boundary corresponding to the insertion of some operator. So let's call it uh, O of zero that will act on the initial state or the initial density matrix, we will act with O of zero. So O of zero will be, let's say, local operators smeared over a time of order beta, just to avoid the uh, ultraviolet issues, um, and uh, localized around uh, t equal to zero, okay, centered around t equal to zero. This will send in a perturbation to this black hole. And then this perturbation, according to uh, the near horizon dynamics, it will redshift, it will redshift and the effects of this perturbation will decay. So the steps are act with O of zero. Then uh, we'll evolve, so we go to large times where perturbations decay. So decay as e to the minus t over beta with some number here uh, related so this type of behavior is sometimes uh, called quasi-normal mode behavior. Um, so you can actually solve the wave equation for perturbations around the black hole background and find uh, the actual rate of decays. And so you can compute these numbers. But you get numbers here of order one and this characteristic uh, with this characteristic decay. Um, we do this and then eventually we measure again, measure using the same operator at some very late times. Okay? So we calculate the expectation value of this operator in the state that was perturbed by O, uh, infinitesimally perturbed by O0. Um, and that uh, involves, so in other words, we are going to be interested in computing the following correlation function, which is the trace of uh, O dagger at t and O of 0. Um, of course, uh, taken with the density, initial density matrix. So we start with the original density matrix, we perturb it a little bit, and then we'll see uh, how much of that uh, perturbation stays after a very long time. So uh, we do all this, um, and what we expect from the bulk is, uh, what the bulk predicts is that um, if we were to plot c of t, so we see this exponential decay, and c of t is supposed to go back to zero. So eventually, uh, we go back to the original, uh, let's say the initial operator had zero expectation value in the initial thermal ensemble. If it didn't, we can just subtract the constant, and then it will have a zero expectation value. Um, and we define it so that it has zero expectation value in the thermal ensemble, and then we'll see this exponential decay uh, e to the minus t over beta is a function of t. Uh, so decaying uh, very fast again and continuously all the way back to zero. So um, now uh, we'd like to see what happens. On the other hand, if you have a unitary system with a finite number of degrees of freedom and you start with the thermal density matrix, 
you expect that this perturbation shouldn't be able to decay completely. We shouldn't be able to revert back to the original thermal ensemble, but we should have a new density matrix which has some perturbation, and so there should be some change in this expectation value at late times. For yes. Uh, no, beta is uh, the inverse temperature. So beta is uh, one over t, and indeed uh, this could be written e minus t times t. Right. So beta is a length scale. So uh, so it's uh, so it's the inverse temperature, which is a length scale. So it's time divided by the length scale. I mean, all this is saying is that uh, over a time of order, the thermal wavelength, uh, this decays by... I mean, the wavelengths are... Comp so if you set the temperature to one, the size of... I mean, the thermal circle to one, then um, this, uh, this is the units in which this decay goes. Um, in the usual Schwarzschild case, it would be just the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, so beta would be the Schwarzschild radius. Then over a Schwarzschild over a time proportional to the light crossing time for the Schwarzschild radius, uh, with this decays by an order e. Um, okay, so uh, we don't expect it to decay completely, and indeed one can uh, show this. Uh, so we rewrite uh, the formula we had there. Um, we rewrite it by summing over energy eigenstates i and j. So we insert uh, first of all we insert some energy eigenstates. So we have some O dagger, and then the O, um, and then we insert uh, the energy eigenstates for the initial state. Um, so e to the minus beta e i over two uh, e i, sorry e i. I was so used to putting the two. So it, this is the thermal factor, and we, this is what we are computing. And then we translate this back to zero, uh, put in. Uh, here, some energy eigenstates, and this we can send back to time t by putting an e to the i h t here, and e to the minus i h t here, and what that gives is uh, an extra factor, um, which is uh, e to the minus e uh, e j minus e i times the time. Okay, so that's a slightly more explicit expression. And it's written in such a way so that we now can define some Cijs, so which are positive, are just given by the product of uh, these two things. Uh, that's all positive times, uh, let's say, also this factor times e to the minus uh, i e j minus e i t. Okay. Now let's say we normalize the operator so that this uh, c of zero is one, right? So the sum of all these c's uh, is equal to one, uh, and then as time progresses, we just all these c's were positive, and at zero, so the whole sum was one. Now, as time progresses, we get these extra faces, so we are bound to get something smaller than one. Okay, so um, as uh, time progresses, these faces uh, get progressively uh, more and more important, and that somehow is consistent with the idea that uh, things will start decaying. Right. So so far. Uh, no, interesting surprise. Um, but uh, we can consider the long time average. So we can take, uh, we can consider the following integral. Let's say zero um, to capital T of uh, dt ct squared. Okay. Um, so we take uh, the square of uh, of this quantity. Um, and we average it over a very long time. So if this indeed goes to zero, this is supposed to go to zero, right? So if c of t continues to decay ex exponentially, this long time average would also continue to decay exponentially. But we can explicitly take this expression, take the long time average, and what we get is uh, some sum over i, j, and k, and l. So there are two sums, one per factor of uh, c here, and we have c i j, c k l, um, am I writing too small again? Uh, and then, uh, so doing the integral, we get some factors of the form e to the i minus ij uh, minus 
ek minus el times capital T uh, minus 1. Okay, here I'm just, uh, I mean, this is just an integral of uh, exponentials. It's very simple to do. Um, so we get, uh, we get factors uh, of this form uh, divided, of course, by the corresponding, no, the, the same delta energy, delta e, ij minus delta e kl, right? Um, okay, so we get this expression and you notice that uh, when, when this difference is equal to this difference, right? Uh, this numerator is zero, but also the denominator is zero, and this whole thing is uh, actually uh, constant, right? Just equal to one. Um, okay, um, therefore, so, and whenever it is not zero, then there is, uh, this is just a phase, and we take the limit when t goes to infinity, uh, if we take the limit uh, when t goes to infinity, all the other terms uh, when this factor is non-zero, they all go away. And so in the end, uh, what we get is uh, sum uh, over all the cases where uh, this difference is equal to this difference. Now, what, is, what are these two differences? So we have the spectrum of the black hole states, which are uh, all the energy eigenstates. And these differences are differences between two arbitrary energy levels, right? So if the spectrum, let's assume, is completely generic, um, and if it is completely generic, uh, then one difference will occur only once. Um, so if, in our, if we have a given i and j, this uh, difference will only be the same for k and l being equal to i and j. So in that case, we end up with the sum c i j squared, of course, if there are some extra degeneracies, it will be bigger than this, but this is, so this is certainly a case uh, where we get something non-zero. So we could even say that this is bigger or equal than this. Um, and in, uh, okay, so that's what we got. So what we got is that the long time average is non-zero and equal to this quantity. And this agrees with the intuition that if we perturb a system with a finite number of degrees of freedom, there is some residual influence that cannot go away. Okay. So now uh, we need to estimate this. So the original sum uh, consistent on, uh, so this, this thing that was one was the sum over i and j of the cijs, which were all positive. So i and j ran, range over all the black hole microstates. So there are, uh, let's say, capital, there are of order e to the s uh, values of the indices i and j, which are relevant uh, for black hole of, uh, the given, so e to the s is the black hole, the number of states in the black hole, e to the s. Uh, and there are twice, uh, so there, there are i and j index, so there are e to the 2s terms uh, in this sum, which just sum up to one. Just since these are, uh, this is a simple operator and these are generic black hole microstates, we might expect that this matrix elements are all more or less of the same order. Uh, so each term, each c, each c is of order uh, e to the minus 2s, so that when we sum over all of them, we get 1. And so here we get the same sum, but with the square. So the same sum with the square will be of order e to the minus 2s. Okay? So we get an e to the minus 4s, and then we have e to the 2s terms, so we get e to the minus 2s uh, for the value uh, here. And so what we see here is that we, we've computed the concrete observable and we computed how, what is the deviation away from uh, the necessary deviation that we should see in this simple observable uh, between the case where we have a unitary evolution and the case when we don't have unitary evolution. So according to, um, if uh, the evolution is unitary, uh, we should see, we can see if uh, this exponential decay, but at the time of order, uh, or time over beta of order s, we should start seeing some, uh, we, th this exponential decay should uh, stop 
and this quantity should start perhaps oscillating and so on with a very tiny amplitude of order e to the minus s. Okay? We were taking the square, that's why we get an extra factor of 2. While the, uh, the sort of gravity prediction might have been that this continues to go down uh, even further. So the, the, the first lesson is that the deviation is very small. So the lesson, so deviation is uh, very small. By deviation, I mean the deviation between the unitary answer and the uh, and non-unitary answer, okay? the answer predicted from gravity. So before we were talking about this exponential decay, which was uh, very quick, and very quickly this became small. And that becoming small is perfectly consistent with unitary evolution. It's, uh, it's only when um, it, it's only when when you go to extremely, extremely small values, or when this decay has gone on for very long times, that we uh, start seeing some deviations. Now, here I should make a small remark because this is uh, this point is sometimes misunderstood. Um, this time is not the Poincaré recurrence. This has nothing to do with Poincaré recurrences. Poincaré recurrences occur over times which are much longer. This is a time of order s. Why Poincaré recurrence in the quantum theory are given by a doubly exponential time of order e to the e to the s. Okay, so this is t Poincaré. This is the time it takes for the black for the whole initial for a given initial state to go back to the same initial state. So it's a huge, uh, hugely, it's a huge time. Um, classical Poincaré recurrence is of order e to the s. Um, but anyway, so we, we are not talking about such long times. We're still talking about long times, but long compared to beta, so further s. Um, and that's where we expect to see some small deviation. Of course, you see that this small deviation in a simple observable, such as uh, measuring some mode of the field, as we were discussing. Um, now, if you consider a very complex, uh, complicated observable, then you might see a bigger deviation. So, I mean, at this time, you can take an operator which is just simply, um, so if you take a complicated operator, O complicated, which is just simply U, um, the simple operator at time t, U minus 1, which is the same as the operator at time 0, right? So we somehow evolve it back by applying the unitary evolution. This is a very complicated operator in terms of the fields at late time. And, well, if you measure that, of course, you will see an order 1 deviation. Um, but we are not we are not talking about complicated operators because we the ones we really see in gravity are the simple ones, um, and those have uh, this small deviation. Now, when we do gravity, so when we do gravity computations on the black hole background, what is the expansion parameter, and what, what how I mean, how much can we trust the gravity discussion? So we discussed, we said that the effective coupling in the context of black holes uh, was, let's say for Schwarzschild black holes, was equal to um, the Planck scale, let's say in four dimensions, the Planck scale divided by the Schwarzschild radius. This was the effective coupling that was governing uh, the semi-classical approximation to the, black hole, um, to the black hole computations, or gravitational computations around the black on, background of a black hole. And this is of order 1 over s, 1 over the black hole entropy. Okay. So if we have some tiny effect, which is of order e to the minus s, then uh, this is of order e to the minus 1 over g effective squared, which is an effect of non-perturbative strength. So this is uh, non-perturbative. So this certainly lies outside uh, what we can calculate in the effective field theory, in certain gravity viewed as an effective field theory, this effect uh, self certainly lies outside because, um, um, and there might be some, there might or might not be some techniques to calculate this by perhaps uh, summing over gravitational instant or something. Well, let me see. When we are talking about effects with this uh, very tiny accuracy, there might be other things that contribute, like other backgrounds, like other solutions. So, 
Um, and in these other solutions, maybe uh, things don't decay or don't decay as fast or don't decay as much. Um, and, and these other solutions then uh, might lead to different predictions. And it's not clear to what extent these other solutions, you, you can really recover the unitary answer using these other solutions. There have been papers in the literature trying to recover the unitary answer from the other solutions and they typically fail. Um, and so it's not, not clear whether you can recover, but the main, the main point I'm making is that you cannot trust the classical uh, geometry or the classical calculations to the accuracy that is needed to actually see the, uh, the difference between the unitary and non-unitary answers. Now the usual discussion of black hole, uh, of black hole formation and evaporation involves measuring the state of uh, the radiation. Right? So we are supposed to form the black hole and then we measure the state of radiation which involves measuring a large number of photons of order, or gravitons or whatever of order s of these particles and that's a really complicated observable and when we have a further s photons uh, again um, perturbation theory starts uh, not being valid anymore uh, because uh, a tiny uh, interaction between them and so on uh, will uh, grow and become uh, essentially effects of order one. So computing the phase of this, uh, of this, computing the phase, so computing this S matrix element including the phase becomes uh, really uh, impossible within the, uh, the perturbation theory. Um, and yeah, so that's, uh, that at least uh, tells us that, uh, okay, from, from the point of view of exterior, we shouldn't uh, be so worried. Um, because it looks like you cannot trust uh, the calculations. Now maybe you can try and find uh, perhaps an observable with a larger effect. Would be nice uh, if you find one which has a larger effect and where you can really say exactly what you're doing and what experiment you're doing uh, to measure it. Uh, so here the experiment was extremely simple, was perturbing the black hole and then measuring the expectation value of a simple operator. And for this simple experiment, uh, you saw that the, um, the difference was very small. And so if you can think of some other simple experiment where the difference is bigger, that would be interesting. But so everything, so the, one of the upshots of this discussion is that everything from the outside, so the black hole is seen from the outside. Um, so that geometry at south of the horizon is really behaving as uh, we expect for a thermodynamic system, so geometry outside. The geometry outside seems to be somehow capturing thermodynamic uh, approximation to the quantum system, right? So we have a well-defined, let's say, quantum system, for example, via the conformal field theory is an example. We have that uh, unitary quantum system and the geometry outside seems to capture the thermodynamics of this system. Now this can be extremely may be made extremely precise for black brains. So if you have black brains uh, in the long distance limits one can find a very precise relation between uh, the gravity modes which have very long distance on black brains um, and gravity and Einstein's equations near the black hole horizon lead to uh, hydrodynamics, correspond to hydrodynamics, the equations of hydrodynamics uh, on the boundary theory as we expect. So we have a black brain, we have a thermal system which is extended and the equations of gravity uh, become those of hydrodynamics and Relati in general relativistic hydrodynamics and in the non-relativistic limit they also become the Navier-Stokes, the usual Navier-Stokes equations for very low velocity motions. Anyway, so that's a very nice story, um, but it's an example uh, of, uh, it's a manifestation of this general feature. And in fact, we, we expect that the other modes, so the, not just the long distance, but any uh, mode outside the horizon, is roughly like, uh, so this is just an analogy, is analogous, very analogous to 
Um, let's say, talking about the distribution functions that appear in the Boltzmann equation. So, in, you know, in the Boltzmann equations, you have distribution functions as a function of x and p. Um, so, so, the Boltzmann equation is something you use to... Uh, are you familiar with the Boltzmann equation? I assume you are. So, you use to describe gases of uh, interacting... So, an in, a weakly interacting gas. Um, and so, in each uh, region of space, you have some distribution of particles at that point and, and momenta. Um, and then uh, this evolved according to the Boltzmann equation, and that evolution uh, necessarily increases the entropy. Okay, so it always will tend to equilibrium, and it increases the entropy. So um, we don't see the unitarity of the original uh, theory, or the time reversibility of the original theory, once we go to these Boltzmann variables, right? In the same way that we don't see it uh, in the case of black holes. Um, so roughly speaking, uh, all the other modes would be analogous to these uh, distribution functions. And when we perturb the system, they all go back to equilibrium, and we have increase of entropy and so on. Okay, so that's... Uh, it would be nicer to make this uh, correspondence a little more precise. Um, okay, so that's everything from the black hole from outside. There is no, uh, no big problem. Now, much of the recent discussion has been... Uh, centered on what happens when we look at the black hole, uh, when we try to include the interior, and when we try to give a description of the interior. So that, um, what I said over there, was a, a rough statement of what it would mean to, um, I mean, how we should think about the operators uh, outside the horizon. So the variables outside the horizon are like... Uh, essentially thermodynamic variables of the, of the boundary system. Um, and give a, I gave a somewhat rough analogy that they should be similar to those distributions that we have for an ordinary gas. But the black hole is not just the exterior. The important feature of a black hole is that uh, an observer who falls in uh, actually feels nothing at the horizon. Okay. And we would like to recover that fact too. So we would like to be able to say that, uh, well, an observer who falls in can fall into the horizon. So now we, um, we have again this, uh, let's say, the collapse geometry, for example. And so far we were discussing things measured uh, asymptotically at infinity. But we now would like to see, well, we have some observer who goes in and crosses the horizon. Do we recover this from the uh, conformal field theory description? So, and how do we recover it, right? So what we want, what we really want is two things. So the, the ideal thing is to have a description which is manifestly unitary. First, unitarity. Um, so we want these two properties. And second, that we want to see that uh, the experiences we want to, within the, the, with this description, which is manifestly unitary, we want to describe the experiences of uh, infalling observers. Observers, when they are in the interior region, okay? So, of course, we can describe them when they are far away, but when they are in the interior, we'd like to say what, what you need to do to calculate what the person will see in the interior. Right? And in order, let's say, if we want to say what happens at the singularity, um, or how the, the sing Schwarzschild singularity is resolved, we suddenly have to do this as a first step. Okay? Um, so even though we uh, claim to understand the black hole as seen from the outside, we haven't understood how the, the singularity, Schwarzschild singularity is, uh, is resolved. Right? So that uh, has not been understood. And that has not been understood because nobody no one has proposed, uh, well, or at least the people have proposed, but there is no accepted, generally accepted, reasonable uh, enough uh, description of uh, the second point in uh, the language where the unitarity is manifest. Okay. Um, and an important point uh, that distinguishes black holes from other systems is that the thermal aspects of black holes come from tracing out the interior. Okay. So initially, we had here pure state, 
and we traced out the interior, and that's why we got the thermal aspects. Um, in uh, ordinary systems, thermal aspects also uh, come because we traced out something else. But the something else we traced out, well, it might be very far removed from, from what, I mean, if we have this, uh, this glass of water and it's in a, in a mixed state, right, whatever purifies it is somewhere in the universe because the universe started in the initial Hartle-Hawking state produced by inflation. Um, but it's very far away from this cup. It's just not necessarily there. And if I jump into this cup, I won't, uh, you know, I won't necessarily encounter some nice smooth interior. Um, okay, so that's uh, what makes uh, the black hole different. And so, um, okay, so, so now um, people have proposed some vague scenarios. So let's discuss a vague scenario. which uh, was called, uh, we called black hole complementarity. Um, and it's uh, the following idea. So it's the idea that, so first of all, we had the operators in the exterior. And we think that those operators in the exterior, well, first of all, the operators which are really well defined in the CFT, let me do, do a bigger thing here, are operators which are very close to the boundary. Those we know exactly how to translate in a completely state-independent way, and those we are absolutely sure about. Then we can start talking about operators which are localized uh, further inside the black hole. There it's uh, less crystal clear, but uh, people have proposed some ways of relating the operators here to operators which are smeared here on the boundary theory. And it seems somewhat reasonable that you could define those. So there are some operators, so those uh, local operators here, so these are bulk operators. So this is an exterior bulk operator at some bulk point x. So those local operators in the outside of the horizon, they seem to correspond to some, some operator in the CFT, okay? That acts on the space of microstates of the, the black hole. So they act on the Hilbert space of black hole microstates. The, the, this is the Hilbert space which is counting the black hole entropy, okay? Um, so now, uh, what about the operators, the interior operators? So these are the operators which act in the interior, okay? So the question is whether, uh, how are those operators realized? Um, and this black hole complementarity idea was that these operators also act on HM. So hypothesis, hypothesis. These operators also act on HM, but they are very complicated operators. So the idea is that uh, these are, so we have, um, so here simple fields, simple field expectation values um, correspond to these operators. And those same simple field operate, uh, operators in the interior, um, when we try to express them in terms of operators in the exterior, or as operators on HM, they are very complicated. And in particular, we cannot talk at the same time between the whole set of operators in the exterior and the whole set of operators in the interior in the sense that a O interior with any exterior operator will be non-zero. And that's where this complementary idea comes from, so the fact that these operators would uh, not commute with each other. so that they are uh, both acting on the same Hilbert space, but they are non-commuting with each other. So that uh, was the idea. Notice that this is actually not exactly what we, what we wanted, because what we wanted was uh, to have entanglement between things outside and things inside. And when we have entanglement, we have operators which uh, actually commute with each other. Okay? So that uh, already contains a slight problem. But but well, this was some vague idea, and since it was uh, vague and you didn't say exactly how these were constructed, well, it might or might not be true. But the interesting recent progress by a uh, bunch of people, so Mathur, uh, uh, Br uh, Brownstein, uh, Marolf and Wald, uh, and uh, Amps, 
uh, Almihiri, Maros, Polchinski, and Sully, and Stanford, and other people. So what they have shown is that uh, actually this picture is incorrect. Okay. So this uh, cannot be true. Okay. So I'll try to uh, I'll try to review uh, their argument. So the, fir the first version of their argument involved uh, the following idea. So if the black hole is supposed to behave like an ordinary system with uh, some Hilbert space of microstates, then um, we can consider a situation where the black hole is entangled, is entangled, entangled, with some other system. Let's say it could be a spin system, right? Uh, or could be its own, the own, its own emitted radiation and so on. So I'm, I'm not discussing how, uh, what process made it entangled, but um, let's, uh, for the sake of the argument, imagine that we have a black hole uh, that becomes maximally entangled with a bunch of spins. Uh, I'll later explain uh, how you can uh, generate this maximal entanglement. Um, by maximal entanglement, what I mean is that we have a pure state psi, which describes the black hole and this uh, set of spins, and that if we trace over the if we trace over the spins over the Hilbert space of the spins, uh, this uh, pure state, then for the black hole case, so the density matrix for the black hole uh, is just the thermal density matrix. Or if we think about it in the microcanonical ensemble, it's just one, okay? the identity matrix. So um, I'll discuss in a second how we can uh, generate in a simple way a state like this. But let's, for the sake of the argument, assume we have this state. Um, OK. Then. Uh, Let's uh, consider uh, let's consider a qubit uh, that uh, so we consider a field mode outside the horizon. Let's say it's a fermionic uh, field mode uh, with a given frequency. Uh, we'll take the frequency to be of order the Hawking temperature, and we'll also take uh, so that we have equal probability for this fermion fermionic mode to be occupied or not occupied, roughly equal, and uh, we'll. Um, um, and we'll take it to be uh, a mode that can, in principle, easily reach the boundary. So it could be an S-wave mode that can reach the boundary, and it's a mode that we can easily uh, measure from the boundary, so we can be sure that it's a mode that should carry some information about the black hole, because it's one of these modes that we can change by acting with the boundary observable or as asymptotic observable, uh, and we can read off the state the state of this mode. And this mode in the bulk evolves obeying a simple wave equation so that its quantum information is preserved through the evolution in the bulk. OK, so this, this mode, therefore, should be realized, should act as a, should be a qubit embedded inside this uh, big dimensional Hilbert space. So the qubit that describes this mode should be some qubit uh, in, this, uh, in this Hilbert space. OK, is that clear? So let's call that uh, mode qubit B. So B is, represents both the three cre some, the fermion creation operator, or the uh, so which describes a qubit, and also the three Pauli matrices describing this qubit, and the physical qubit itself. So we describe them all by the same letter. Um, so in in this maximally entangled state, uh, so here among there is this spin system. And we can choose any basis we want in this spin system. Um, and uh, we choose a basis in such a way that uh, this qubit is entangled with, so we diagonalize the entanglement, if you wish. And this qubit then will be maximally entangled with some other qubit uh, state or operator, C. Um, OK? So that uh, B and C are forming essentially like a bell pair. Um, so we can, always, we can choose here. I mean, here all we are using is that we can choose a basis where we separate out one qubit 
and it's the qubit that is entangled with this one. Okay. Um, okay. So we can do that. So these two are maximally entangled, just that by assumption. And if the black hole is any ordinary system as described from the outside, we can certainly do this. So for any system that has a qubit, uh, we can entangle it to spin system, and we can diagonalize these qubits, and so on. So that can always be done. Now the new thing with the black hole is the presence of this other uh, qubit in the interior, which is the partner uh, mode, which we are going to denote by the letter A. And if we want the near horizon geometry to be smooth, then these two should also be uh, maximally entangled. They should be essentially in a pure state, which is the hurdle hawking state here, uh, um, the vacuum uh, state here in the black, black hole near horizon geometry. So this uh, qubit should be maximally entangled both with this and with that one. Okay? So that's what we require. Uh, so the first entanglement came from, uh, from unitarity, if you wish. Uh, and uh, from saying the black hole is like an ordinary quantum system. And this uh, came from the smoothness of the near horizon geometry. You see, if a qubit B was as in any other thermal system, okay, so the thermal aspects come from the fact that it's entangled with C, but in the black hole, it's really coming because it's entangled with A. Now, can we have, um, can we have this? So according to... Um, So in particular, this uh, black hole complementarity idea was saying that A somehow was also living in the HM Hilbert space. Um, but well, that we, even, uh, we don't even need to use. So what we need to use to run into a problem is that uh, we have these uh, in, this three independent qubits entangled in this fashion, and this is impossible. So what happens is that if do, these two are entangled, and then you, know, you try to entangle this with this, you will disrupt uh, this entanglement. But one can make this uh, more quantitatively precise, because there is a quantum information uh, bound, which is uh, the strong, the strong subadditivity bound, which says that if you have a Hilbert space that has uh, three tensor factors. Then uh, you can compute the entanglement entropy of S, and you have some state here, which could be a density matrix in this whole state, whole system. You have A uh, union B plus the entropy of uh, C union B should be uh, bigger or equal than the entropy of B plus the entropy of uh, A union B union C. Okay. So that's uh, an inequality. It's called uh, strong subadditivity, and it um, it can be proven. It's uh, not uh, super easy to prove it, but it was proven by Ruskai and Lib, uh, Elliot Lib. And now let's apply it to this case. So in this case, A and B are that's denoted here by the same letters A and B, and um, this, uh, by assumption of maximal entanglement, this will be close to zero. This also will be close to zero. But B uh, is, because we are considering a mode at the near Hawking temperature, this mode by itself is uh, in a random thermal state. So this entropy for that qubit is uh, log 2. And we have a contradiction. We have a contradiction regardless of whether this entropy, what, what this is, because this is also bigger than zero, uh, bigger or equal than zero. And so we uh, have a problem. Okay. So it's impossible to do this. And so the main achievement of uh, these people is to rule out uh, these uh, vague ideas. Um, so they were not uh, the pro So they were not vague enough, and they can be ruled out by clever argument. No, I, well, I didn't need to use, but in this argument in particular rules this out. It roots this out because in the, that uh, scenario, A is uh, some, also some qubit mode that acts on the uh, black hole Hilbert space. Right? So we cannot have these three qubits be acting on the same Hilbert space. Um, we cannot have these three qubits being independent operators acting on the same Hilbert space. 
Okay. Okay. So, uh, so now we should, th therefore, we need to uh, to solve this problem. Well, you see, this is a problem with this particular way of constructing the interior. And if you, uh, so then, uh, what can you say? So, uh, what what can be said now? You can say various options. So I'll, um, ah, before before I, I get uh, into these options, let me say uh, two things that I've uh, avoided before. Um, well, one I, I said, but I'll say it again. So we assume that this mode B was a mode that could carry the information out of the black hole, right? So it was a mode that was coming out of the black hole or a mode that would reach the boundary in the ADS-CFT setup. And so that's, uh, that assumption was necessary to, um, to, to say that this is a mode that, when, that lives in the black hole microstate and then when we entangle the black hole with some other system, that particular mode will be entangled, right? If it had been a mode completely unrelated to the black hole information that doesn't contribute somehow to the black hole entropy, uh, then, uh, then we couldn't have done this so clearly. Now, there is the intuitive idea that all the modes that are outside the horizon, even those that cannot reach infinity, also contribute to the black hole entropy. This is a commonly made assumption, but uh, this does not quite rely on that assumption. There are many modes in the near horizon geometry Recall that the near horizon, so if we look at this in Rinder space, we have this gravitational potential, uh, which is very deep. And so there are many modes that are coming in and out and bouncing from this gravitational potential. Um, and all those modes uh, never make it out to infinity. But um, and there were the modes that were given the divergent contribution to the entanglement entropy. And all of those, uh, well, uh, might or might not uh, the, the first impression is that they would contribute to the black hole entropy, but maybe maybe they don't. But this argument doesn't rely on that. This argument relies on the modes that actually made it out of out of the black hole and really um, contribute. So that was point number one. Point number two is uh, how we can generate this uh, entanglement between the black hole and a second system. Okay. So if we have uh, two Hilbert spaces, H1 and H2, with the dimension of H2 much bigger than the dimension of H1. Um, and we start with some state Psi1 and some other state, let's say, zero here. And we let, let these two interact with a generic uh, Hamiltonian, or we wait for a long time with a somewhat generic Hamiltonian. Then we expect that uh, after a while, we'll get some state Psi, which uh, will be a random state in this big Hilbert space. And then for a random state in the big Hilbert space, uh, Page has argued that um, if we now take the density matrix tracing over H2 of that uh, random state, we'll get the row uh, in the system one, which is close to the identity matrix, so close to maximal thermal. So the idea is that just letting the system interact will generate this uh, maximal entanglement in a very natural way. OK. So, that's, uh, so in particular, you can uh, think about this in the following way. So you take the black hole, uh, and the, you form the black hole, and you let it evaporate till it uh, emitted uh, a big chunk of, I mean, more than half of the initial entropy uh, went into the radiation. So now you have the final black hole um, and the radiation. So H1 would be the final black hole. And H2 in that description would be the radiation. And well, the, the dynamics that, that governs this black hole evolution, we think it's probably generic enough that these two are uh, maximally entangled. And therefore, uh, we'll be in a situation as we described over there. This argument can be generalized so that uh, you don't need to make this assumption, but uh, it is a little clearer to understand it by making this assumption. Um, so we assume that, uh, so in some sense, there's just natural process of black hole evaporation. If it is a generic enough evolution, 
uh, will generate this maximal entanglement for you naturally. Okay. Now, the, the, first, the first thing you need to understand in this uh, story is that you should distinguish the paradox from the proposed resolutions of the paradox. Right? So the paradox is, uh, it's, uh, or, or the, this, this issue is a correct problem for that particular realization of the, um, of the interior operators. Okay? And so um, you can try to uh, change how you are going to realize the interior or uh, you could, well, you could do various things. So there are various natural options now. Um, so option number one is to say that there is no interior. Okay? That this shows that uh, under this situation, so for a black hole that is maximally entangled with a second system, there will be no interior. Okay? Um, and this is uh, also sometimes called the firewall. The authors of uh, some of these papers have um, have claimed that their argument was an argument for firewalls. You should really think of this as a proposed resolution of this paradox, okay? uh, which could be as uh, correct or wrong as other proposed resolutions. Um, now, the second, uh, the second it would be to say that there is some uh, non-locality, non-locality or non-causality, so non-causality. in the bulk so that the information can jump out and uh, not be affected by this argument. Um, I would say the, the third proposal was to say that uh, the operators OI actually um, depend on the state, so depend, depend on the state of the black hole psi. Okay? So in ordinary quantum mechanics, uh, an operator is just a fixed thing that doesn't depend on what your state is. But they want, they so this is uh, Pap Raju and Papadodimas. They proposed uh, some construction where these uh, operators depend on the state. And let me, um, I I'll discuss uh, it in a little bit more, uh, a bit more in a second. Um, so number. Four is to say that the topology of the space-time is different. Um, so that the qubit uh, A and the qubit C are not uh, causally disconnected. Uh, topology. That's uh, the ER equal to EPR idea. So according to that idea, roughly speaking, the qubit A is in the future of C. So uh, should not be viewed as independent qubits. Um, then uh, a fourth uh, idea, a fifth idea is that uh, um, is to say, well, okay, so you can have this problem, but in order to really uh, in order to really find a contradiction, you would need to actually observe these three qubits. Okay, and how can we observe these three qubits? So the first thing you can do is this qubit C can be distilled from all these pins. So we can do a quantum computation that uh, selects this qubit C and transfers it to, um, to some physical spin, let's say in a doer. So there is some uh, guy here in a rocket. Um, someone here and has a doer with the spin, okay? The quantum spin, which has not been measured, is a spin C uh, that has, is entangled with B. And so, he, and this person will then go into the black hole and he will measure B and check whether the entanglement between B and C is uh, correct. And uh, in principle, one can also measure the entanglement, check the entanglement between uh, A, and, A and B, okay? And, um, and so for, uh, so this, this person will have access to all three qubits and uh, therefore will uh, be able to run into a contradiction. But uh, the operation of, of this still in this qubit is computationally complex. And maybe it cannot be done in time uh, to run this experiment. So if you had an evaporating black hole, 
uh, you might uh, generate naturally this entanglement between H and the radiation. But now here someone should be able to run a quantum computation here, quantum computation, whose input is all this radiation and whose output is the qubit C, okay? That is entangled with the qubit B living outside this horizon. And the idea is that uh, the time it takes is uh, exponential. So they argued, so this is um, Hayden um, and Harlow, or Harlow, I guess Harlow comes first. Harlow and Hayden argued uh, that uh, this time is exponential in the black hole entropy. Okay. So that's the time it takes. So it's a computationally complex uh, operation. They, they showed quite, uh, well, they, they really showed that this is, uh, this is computationally complex and uh, cannot be done quickly enough. Now this is, uh, not, uh, this, is, this is not per se a construction of uh, the interior. This is just a way to say that the paradox, we cannot run into the paradox and that perhaps uh, the fact that um, this seems to be an important fact. So what, what I particularly think is that there is probably something right in these various ideas in some sense uh, and that uh, the truth is perhaps some sixth one that hasn't been yet found. So I, I like, how much time do I have? Uh, 20 minutes? 25, yeah. Um, so now I'd like to uh, say a few more things about uh, some of uh, these proposals, uh, some, what, what they are. So in particular, I'll discuss a bit more number three and number four. Uh, and uh, then I'd like to uh, end by saying the, what are problems with all the proposals. Um, So we'll try to do an equal opportunity criticism for all of them. Or maybe, maybe since I'm running out of time, let me start a bit with some criticisms and I'll, I'll do the criticisms and the, the statement of what they are uh, together. Okay, so let's start with uh, firewalls. Um, now, the most uh, precise, perhaps, idea for how to create the firewalls are this idea of fastballs. The idea is that the, uh, there are lots of microstate geometries, and they, are all, they all contain some, uh, they, none of them contains a horizon, but they contain some structure near the horizon. Um, and, well, when you, uh, when you try to fall in, you hit this, and you are... Uh, you're, you're dead, okay? And there are so many of them that uh, even though the probability of tunneling into each of them is very small, uh, you might have that it tunnels to, since there are many final states, it just happens immediately after you for, form the black hole. So that, those are two ideas for how you could possibly make the firewall. Um, now, I, I should say that uh, if you, um, if at the horizon, if, if the horizon is not smooth and you replace it by some singular object, um, then you lose the prediction of Hawking radiation. So the, the, the prediction that of uh, thermal properties or T-Hawking, let's say, prediction is not, uh, is not, is not necessarily true anymore. In other words, if one computed the fastball and one found uh, more fastballs than uh, the black hole entropy, okay, well, that might be the right answer. So there are no black holes. There, um, and um, also, if uh, these firewalls form at late times, then why is it that we uh, cannot detect any effect from the outside? Recall that the prediction of Hawking temperature relied on the smoothness uh, at the horizon. And so now, that, now that the horizon is not smooth anymore, the Hawking temperature doesn't have any reason to be uh, the value it was uh, before the firewall formed. This is a somewhat vague objection, but I think uh, it's a reasonable objection. And it's a reason not to like it. And also, I, I think that uh, 
it, it's a this problem of trying to make the unitary, the unitarity manifest and the locality manifest is uh, a very interesting problem and probably will teach us something about uh, gravity. And uh, just giving up on one or the other thing, giving up on unitarity or giving up on uh, the locality and smoothness predicted by general relativity is probably, it's probably wrong. So I, that's my prejudice. So I think uh, my pressure this is that uh, we should find a way to make, uh, we should find the reason why this fire was, well, well we should find the, the way to describe the interior, which uh, is not subject to this, uh, this particular objection. Um, okay. Um, so that's uh, firewalls. Then, um, um, okay. Now let, let's discuss a bit more this uh, Papadimas Redshoe proposal. So, their, their proposal uh, is uh, most well defined for black holes that are in a pure state. So, um, so we have a black hole which is in a pure state. And, uh, and then um, we have this qubit B, which is realized as some operator, some exterior operator. And so we have, in fact, the whole algebra of uh, simple exterior operators. So these are simple field theory modes. It's, uh, they don't quite form an algebra because uh, uh, you can multiply it in principle infinite times, but if you put a bound on their complexity, how many you have, you have something roughly like a, a finite dimensional algebra. Um, which, uh, and then if you start with the initial state and you act with all possible exterior operators that belong in this algebra, you generate uh, some um, Hilbert space H uh, sub A sub A. Um, which comes from acting with all these uh, elements of the algebra. And this is smaller in general than the full. So this is contained within the microstate, uh, this Hilbert space of microstates, but its, its dimension is much smaller than the entropy of the black hole. Okay. Um, and um, none of these operators uh, annihilates the state. So when you act with the operator, in general, uh, you will not, they will not annihilate the state because, um, yeah, this is the fact that the, if, you have a localized, uh, if you have a localized operator acting on the vacuum, it uh, does not annihilate the vacuum. So you don't, don't have any uh, operator that annihilates the vacuum in ordinary quantum field theory. So the operators that annihilate the vacuum are defined everywhere. So an example is an annihilation operator for a field theory mode of momentum P that annihilates the vacuum, but you require to define it everywhere in space. But if you restrict to only half of the space, for example, then there is no operator that annihilates the vacuum. So in particular, so if you have, let's say, the Rinder operators, so you have, let's say, uh, let's as an example take Rinder space with the right and left regions and uh, for inspiration for what we are going to do. Um, so we have the creation operator of the left moving modes and the creation of the right moving operators with the corresponding energy. And the Minkowski vacuum has uh, this uh, expression in terms of the left and right Rinder vacuums. Okay? So in particular, notice that if we act with a fermion annihilation operator on, on the exterior, well, let's say, so we act with the annihilation operator for, let's say, the left modes on zero Minkowski. Um, then uh, what will happen is that since this guy commutes with the right ones, this, from the point of view of this left moving creation operator, this looks like a coherent state. And when we act with this, we bring down a factor here, e to the minus omega uh, beta over two, uh, b dagger right omega acting on the zero vac Minkowski vacuum, so the original state. So we see that uh, the annihilation operator doesn't annihilate the state, and furthermore, 
it gives the same as acting with the creation operator on the other side. Okay? So we re related the action of an operator here on the left to an operator here on the right. And we have a similar expression when we here replace right and left. Okay? So this, this, in this particular case, it shows that the action of all, this operator, all the left operators on the vacuum can be represented as acting with the right operators on the vacuum. And so we can uh, therefore do a similar construction. So given a generic uh, black hole uh, microstate, uh, we, can, um, we can define some uh, O tilde operators, um, which are, let's say, defined in such a way that um, when we have an operator with a certain energy acting on uh, psi, um, so this will define the action on the original state, will be given by e to the minus omega beta over 2 times uh, the corresponding, let's say, dagger operator with the same energy, uh, but now exterior operator. Okay? So for each, uh, for each um, exterior operator, we define the corresponding uh, interior operator uh, via this formula plus the condition plus the condition that it commutes with all the other exterior operators. So if we have some other exterior operators or sequences of exterior operators prime here, this could be any product of exterior operators and we have this guy. Um, then we define this to be e to the minus omega beta over 2. Uh, this same whole sequence of exterior operators, O prime, times uh, this guy, O dagger E. Okay. So now uh, you see this defines, so since this O could be any of the elements of the algebra, this defines the action of O on HA, right? So for any element of HA, it tells us that acting with O tilde on some element of HA, it gives us some other element of HA. So we can, um, this is uh, really defining uh, the operator O tilde. And it defined in this way, uh, the state that um, the initial state psi will look like the vacuum, will look like, uh, again, this state. Okay? So if this discussion is abstract, let me just uh, replace the words O and O tilde here, everywhere, but by B right and B left, where B right are the exterior operators that we know. Um, and, uh, and after doing this whole construction, you'll find that uh, the initial state will obey the same equation uh, as this state. And this is the equation that we need to uh, ensure that the two are, um, that we have in the vacuum, right? So this is, um, follows from the fact that the Minkowski modes are well-defined and continuous. So defined in this way, so if you define the operators in this way, you will find, yes, go ahead. Uh, sorry, here there should be a psi. Yeah, I, I made a mistake. This should be a, the psi, the same state that you are given. So you're given this pure state, um, and here we have uh, the same state. Okay. So these are exterior operators acting on that state. Okay. Um, okay. Um, now the, the, the subtlety with this is that these operators that have been defined this way are state dependent, okay? But defined this way, they define the interior in a completely smooth way, and there are no, no problems with the previous discussion. And the reason there are no problems is precisely because this, uh, this operator is state dependent. This is a departure from uh, standard quantum mechanics. And just to emphasize how big this departure is, let me, uh, let me try to go back to, let's say, some region near the horizon. I mean, they did this really for a pure state, so you can imagine a collapse in geometry, but we look at uh, some very late times, and we uh, consider some uh, exterior mode. So we first start uh, with some state psi, and we do this construction, so we get the old psi. Now we, act with a, we generate a new state psi prime, which is given by a unitary transformation times the original state psi. This unitary transformation, let's say it's a transformation which acts purely on this side, um, and generates uh, some object here, let's say a track. So it generates 
big truck here, well, coming in towards you, okay? So we can generate that from the vacuum by acting with a unitary transformation. Um, now, if you define the operator so tilde based on psi prime, um, and you uh, then think about what you would measure as you fall in, according to the operators from psi prime, you don't feel anything. It's the same as if you were in the vacuum. If you define this, if you think about this state from the point of view of the operators of psi, then there is a track. Okay. So whether there is a track or not depends on uh, what description you give. Um, now, you could say, well, uh, if you didn't know that you acted here, the problem is that you know you acted with this unitary transformation, and if you know you acted with this unitary transformation, then you will um, be able to show the track was there. Um, but so then it starts depending on the knowledge you have and stuff like this. So, well, it might be a correct feature or not, but notice that applied to everyday life, it doesn't seem to work. In fact, um, so if you, uh, you don't tell your child, uh, don't look uh, when you're he's trying to cross the street. Um, if you were Papadodimus and Rashu, you would tell them, don't look to see where there is a track, because if, um, if you don't look and you don't know the track is coming, you will feel nothing. While if you look, you might know the track is coming and you might be hurt. So. Um, okay, so it's, uh, it's very weird in this sense. Uh, and, and here, I, I, th th there are some ways they try to uh, avoid this issue by, uh, by saying you cannot really act with this unitary and so on. There is some ongoing discussion of whether uh, it is or it is not possible to uh, act with this type of unitaries. There's a paper by Harlow where he tried to argue that uh, it's suddenly possible to act uh, with this type of unitaries and get, um, and get such uh, two different interpretations for the same state. Yeah, any question? What? Yeah. So the point is that according to their proposal, you can have two states um, two, two different states that have different uh, physical interpretation depending on how you, you view them. So if you define, so if you have two states related by a unitary transformation uh, that acts purely on the interior, then um, this, uh, these two states, if, if based on, the, from the point of view of this operator, they are different, right? Um, but if you describe the state in terms of this, these other operators, they actually look the same. They, lo they look vacuum in the inside. So according to these operators, this state is vacuum. This one here, psi is vacuum. According to this description, this psi is vacuum and this guy has uh, the track. Okay? According to uh, the description of this operator, well, it's the other way around. So this guy has nothing and this guy has the track. Okay? So, so and, and you don't know in principle a priori which one you should use. Uh, their description is a little more sophisticated because uh, they want to apply their construction to uh, states which have reached thermal equilibrium. So they, they don't take just a random state, but the state, well, I mean, a random state would obey their conditions, but an important condition is that this state should look completely thermal from the outside point of view. Um, and then the discussion is whether you can, uh, you can consider such unitary transformations or not, and whether they can be produced by some physical process. Um, so in principle, you can, uh, you can think about these unitary transformations, but um, and in detail, it's argued in the paper by Harlow that they can be uh, produced by performing measurements outside. Uh, projection operators outside, by acting with projection operators outside the black hole. Um, and, well, they haven't uh, shown a way around this. Uh, and you, you have to read the papers to get a more complete picture. This is a zeroth order idea, a zeroth order objection. Now, ma many people say, well, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not bothered too much by this state dependence and so on. I mean, we, we know... Uh, that um, our description of water and uh, vapor is, is different, therefore, um, 
Therefore, I mean, I know that the things I want to measure will be different, the operators are different. But, but here the difference is much, uh, much stronger. So in the case of water and vapor, you can always first uh, decide whether you have water or vapor by some projection operator and then define your actual operator. So uh, while here it depends on the, uh, on the absolute microscopic details of, uh, of the state psi, of the actual quantum state. Um, and indeed, well, it leads to nonlinear quantum mechanics and so on. Um, now, maybe I, I suspect there might be something uh, true to this, but uh, it's unclear how to make it work in more detail. Superposition? Yes. Yeah, no superposition, but the question is so, yeah, that, that is true. But nobody has shown that there is something that goes actually wrong for an experiment. Since this is only happening in the interior, you have to design, design some, some experiment that involves the interior in some uh, useful way to, to run into the problem. Th there might be such, ar such an argument, it's just that it hasn't been made yet. Uh, if it involved the exterior and so on, then you probably would run into such, ar such, such problems. Because, but here, this is only supposed to occur to hold from the interior. I mean, that, that's, uh, I think, a generic uh, thing that uh, is important, that in, uh, so th the thing that is being objected by the paradox is to think about these operators as, as acting somehow objectively, without uh, involving the, the guy that falls in and including him explicitly or her implicitly and, uh, and all this story. Um, and it might be that including the observer explicitly is an important part of uh, solving the problem. And n none of the proposals that have been made involves including the observer explicitly and how that would uh, solve the problem. Um, and I, I suspect that that will be also an important uh, part of the resolution. Um, uh, and the construction of the interior. Um, okay, so now i will like to say uh, few more words about ER equal to EPR. Um, and just to argue uh, for it, so let me say, uh, let me ignore the Harlow and Hayden objections, computational complexity, and I assume that I can do whatever I want with the quantum computer. And so I can take uh, the initial black hole and uh, make a second black hole uh, out of the spins, so out of the spins, so I act with the quantum computer, quantum computer, and out comes a second black hole that is maximally entangled with this one. So this would be equivalent to essentially distilling not just a single qubit, but distilling all the qubits of the black hole, right? Because when you uh, have the thermal field double, then um, you have uh, this type of geometry where, so this would be black hole one. This is one of the black holes, the near horizon of one black hole and this is the near horizon of the other black hole. Well, then let me not say whether we are in the S or... The. And then every single uh, mode here has a corresponding mode it's entangled with on the other side. So B and... Uh, so this, this was B and then what I was calling C before would be this mode that of the other black hole. Okay. But now, uh, what is the mode A? So the mode A in this particular situation is this mode that uh, is to the future of C, okay? So A, B, and C are not in a given space-like geodesic. They are on a spa space-like, sorry, space-like surface. They're not independent. Actually, A is in the future of C, okay? And that's the way the, uh, the problem is solved. So the problem, this ent particular entanglement problem is solved by noticing that actually A is in the future of C, and then uh, there is, then they are permitted to be, so A, these, these two entanglements are perfectly consistent, okay? So notice that uh, if you were to do the experiment that we discussed over there of taking out uh, the qubit C and sending it into the black hole, that would involve uh, making some measurement here on the spin system to transfer uh, the qubit, so we are taking out some qubit from here and taking it to this black hole. So somehow we're taking this qubit out and somehow sending it to this side and the action of taking this qubit out is producing a perturbation here 
that has modified uh, the qubit A, and so in this situation, uh, the ER equal to EPR proposal uh, would predict that if you did that experiment that we mentioned over there, the qubit A and B would not be entangled with each other. Okay. But that's only if you distill the qubit. If you don't, uh, and, and if you take it out with you, if you don't, you, you would, they would continue to be entangled. So this particular construction is one for which the uh, AMS paradox would not work. And the question is, if you didn't do this, uh, if you didn't distill the whole black hole and you just had the system of spins, would you have some kind of wormhole or some kind of causal relation of this type? So is it uh, true whether you have a black hole um, and you had these uh, spin systems? Uh, are they connected by some kind of wormhole? Uh, that uh, can support the propagation of signals when you measure this guy, whether it can send a signal behind the horizon. So that's a question, and uh, well, it's not that, certainly that's not clear. But um, they have they they one can make one can make an argument that uh, it wouldn't work for the following reason. So and. These arguments, uh, so the, I presented one version of the AMPS argument, but there are actually several uh, slightly different uh, arguments that apply to various situations that they made in their papers. I would, call, I would say that there are four of them. And, and this uh, discussion gets around one of them, but doesn't get around, or we don't know yet whether it gets around the other one. And this is the argument about the easy measurement. And this is the following thing. So we, we argue that if we distill the qubit C, we might send a signal to here. Now, what if instead of distilling the qubit C, we do an easy measurement of the, on, the, on the spins? So E is some easy measurement that we can do on this spin. So that would, let's say the spins are explicit, or we have the radiation modes outside the black hole horizon, and we measure just one of them. And if we do that, that's uh, this uh, easy measurement. And since uh, the qubit uh, C and the easy measurement are, so they are, this is a very, they are related by a complicated unitary transformation. Uh, it tends to have been the case that the easy measurement and this mode C actually don't commute with each other. And this commutator is not only non-zero, but is of order one. Okay. Um, so by the, it seems that by the act of, uh, measuring any of these qubits, we actually affect, uh, affected the, this qubit C. And so therefore, we, in the same way that we could send a signal when we were affecting the mode C, we can also send a signal when, uh, when we can do this easy uh, operation. Um, and so this is... Uh, um, we, don't, we don't know how to uh, avoid this problem. Um, the idea is that, uh, the, the basic idea is that the construction of the wormhole between the two sides um, actually um, is, uh, depends in some way on the complexity of the state. And if you have more complex entanglement between the two sides, um, you can have and, and this is easy to see in some simple examples, that as you start complicating, you can have that the two, for example, in the particular case of two black holes, the two black hole horizons start getting separated from each other, and then simple signals you, see from, you send from here cannot uh, make it to this side, or cannot make it even to behind the horizon here. So we don't, know, we don't understand the rules for constructing these wormholes, but the rules, as we, uh, as we see from the examples, seem to be such that uh, increasing the complexity of the entanglement away from the thermophile double. So a thermophile double is a very special state because these two horizons are actually touching each other, but in general they will not touch each other. And if they don't touch each other, then uh, sort of simple measurements we do here do not reach uh, the region behind the horizon. But it's, it's again not clear whether these type of geometries are they generic um, is this the generic one, or uh, is the generic one one in which they are close? So maybe this, these ones when they are separated are actually not generic. Um, and this an the answer to this question is not known. So 
Um, now, a further comment I would like to make about this uh, computational complexity. So, this, uh, this idea tells us that we cannot obviously run the experiment that uh, they had. However, um, it doesn't address this uh, type of, uh, of, um, of objection. So, um, if instead of distilling the qubit, we just do a simple measurement on the uh, qubits uh, that uh, acts on the spin. Okay, so. So if the qubit uh, A is actually realized somehow as a qubit in the system of spins, um, or in the future of them, then uh, by doing these easy measurements, we perturb, we perturb it. And uh, if we perturb it, then th this is simple. So the ha this um, Harlow and Hayden story cannot uh, prevent that from happening. So one, uh, probably one needs to combine these uh, various ideas. So one probably needs to combine computational complexity with uh, either Papadodimas Raju or this uh, ER equal to EPR or something like this. In order to um, in order to uh, get some more coherent story, but while well, this has not been done, uh, and hopefully it will done at some will be done at some point, um, and let me see, let me see what else I was planning to say. Um, ah, how much time do I have? I run out of time. I'm at overtime, yeah. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll finish here. I'll just say that uh, I think this is a very uh, important problem, and uh, we eventually, hopefully, will understand how to think about the interior. Um, a test that you have understood how to think about the interior is to be able to tell what happens at the singularity. Uh, so what, what, what's the more precise description of the singularity? Is there one or isn't there one? Uh, and so on. Well, thank you.